Hello. In this video, we will prove the Pauli exclusion principle, which states that we cannot have two electrons with the same spin in the same orbital in the same atom. Another way to phrase the principle is that for the set of four quantum numbers, where n is the principal quantum number, m sub l is the magnetic quantum number, and also the z component of the orbital angular momentum projected onto the z-axis, m sub s, which is the projection of the spin angular momentum onto the z-axis, and l, the orbital angular momentum quantum number. Those four numbers cannot be the same for any two electrons in the same atom. Now this is a special case of a more fundamental property of electrons, and that is that electrons are fermions. The significance of this for fermions is that if we take two electrons, electrons one and two, and we swap them, so for example, if we have a wave function right now involving two electrons, one and two, and if we swap one and two, so that one goes to two and two goes to one, the overall wave function will change sign. This is a contrast to bosons, where if we take the wave function for a boson, a wave function of two bosons, one and two, and we swap the two bosons, in that case, we would have the same wave function back with a positive sign. So we say that the fermion wave functions are anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetric means we get this minus sign when we swap them. And the bosons are symmetric, which means we would get a positive sign if we swap two bosons. So our first step is to make use of the principle that we have two electrons with the same spin. There are defined spin functions, alpha and beta. For example, alpha of one means that electron one is up, so it has an m sub s of plus one half. If we have beta of one is equivalent to the idea of a down electron, an electron where m sub s is equal to minus one half. An effective way to come up with a function of spin for two electrons with the same spin. The easiest such function is alpha of one, alpha of two. So this tells us that both electrons one and two have a spin of m sub s of plus one half. We notice something special about this particular spin function in that if we swap Electrons 1 and 2, that gives us alpha of 2, alpha of 1, but the spin functions commute. So that means this is exactly equal to alpha of 1, alpha of 2, which tells us that if we swap 1 and 2, at least with the wave function we have so far, that the wave function does not change sign. So that tells us that the spin function that we have so far is a symmetric function. So we see the spin for the case where we have two electrons with both an up spin, the spin part is symmetric. Ah, but we know that the overall wave function for an electron has to be anti-symmetric because we have two fermions. Electrons are fermions. So what we can get around this is we can get an overall wave function that is anti-symmetric, and I will just abbreviate anti-symmetric as AS. One way to do that is to multiply a anti-symmetric function times a symmetric function. So anti-symmetric times symmetric will give us an overall anti-symmetric wave function. Similarly, another way to do it would be if the first function was symmetric and the second function was anti-symmetric. So we've noticed that our spin function that we've written so far is symmetric. So we can use this particular psi sub s to be the spin part. So we'll write that as 
spin, since we know that is symmetric. And then the rest of our wave function, the anti-symmetric part, will involve just the spatial part of the wave function. So this is where is the electron uh, in space, in three dimensions, is the spatial part of the wave function. And its m sub s value, its spin, is related to this psi sub spin part. And since the psi sub spin part is symmetric, we have to make the psi spatial part anti-symmetric. So we write that down to remind ourselves that the psi spatial part of this wave function has to be anti-symmetric. Because if it's anti-symmetric, the spin part is symmetric, we get an overall valid anti-symmetric wave function for the two electrons. Now for the spatial part, let us assume that the two electrons are in two orbitals. And we're going to call the orbitals A and orbital B for simplicity. So we'll assume one of the electrons is going to be in orbital A and one of the orbital electrons is going to be in orbital B. So a way to write orbital A and orbital B is just simply as psi of A and psi of B. So we're going to make this spatial wave function as some combination of these two orbitals, orbital A and orbital B. So a useful way to write such an anti-symmetric wave function is we can have the first electron in orbital A and the second electron in orbital B. That's one combination. Another combination we could have is to have electron two in orbital A and electron number one be in orbital B. Now the key thing about this wave function when we write it as some combination of orbital A and orbital B is this part has to be anti-symmetric. And to make it anti-symmetric, we link these two superposition states by a minus sign. By a minus sign. And to normalize it, we use a one over the square root of two as our normalization constant. The important thing to see here is that this function actually is anti-symmetric. So our anti-symmetric spatial part of 1 and 2, we've written as 1 over the square root of 2 times psi of a of 1, psi of b of 2, minus psi of a of 2, psi of b of 1. So now what we want to do with this is to prove that it actually is anti-symmetric. And the way we do that is to swap 1 and 2 inside the wave function. So, we, so let's see what the function we get. We'll write this as psi spatial of 2 comma 1. And that's just going to take this function and swap 1 into it. So the normalization constant doesn't change. Wherever we have a 1, we turn it to a 2. Wherever we have a 2, we turn it to a 1. So that gives us a psi of a of 2, psi of b of 1, minus psi of a of 1 times psi of b of 2. Okay. So that is, that's the wave function that we get if we swap 1 and 2. But now the important thing to see is that this and this term are the same as each other except we swap the sign. Here we have a positive and here we have a negative. And the same thing happens with this particular term, that here we have minus psi a of 1, and here we have positive psi a of 1. So what we see is that psi spatial of 1 comma 2 is exactly equal to the minus of psi spatial of 2 comma 1. So this proves that this spatial part of the wave function is legitimate since it is anti-symmetric. we can conveniently write the spatial part of the function 
as a determinant, so it's 1 over the square root of 2, and then we have psi a of 1, psi b of 1, psi b of 2. And here we use the properties of determinants. So it's a reminder that if we have a 2 by 2 determinant with entries a and b in the first row and c and d in the second row, by the property of determinants, is equal to a times d minus b times c. It's almost like a sort of cross multiplication uh, feature. So that would give us psi a of 1 times psi b of 2 minus psi a of 2 times psi b of 1, which is exactly our spatial part of the wave function that we had proposed earlier. So now we have the spatial part of the wave function, and previously we had worked out the spin part. So we are now we are able to combine both parts to get an overall valid wave function for two electrons with the same spin. So our overall wave function which is right as psi, is equal to the spin part times the spatial part that we worked out already. So that gives us 1 over the square root of 2, that's just our normalization constant in front, times alpha of 1, alpha of 2, and that is our spin part. And then the spatial part combines, we have we have the 1 of the square root of 2. So we have psi a of 1 times psi a. 2, psi b of 1, psi b of 2. So this in purple is our overall valid anti-symmetric wave function that has the proper spin characteristics that we're looking for, that both electrons have the same spin. So now we want to prove that the two electrons, 1 and 2, cannot be in the same place at the same time. In other words, they cannot be in the same orbital. So how do we do that? So now we simply assume, or let, psi b go to psi a. So basically this means that the position of the orbital psi b will go so that it coincides with the orbital psi of a. In other words, uh, we're bringing the electron 2 and electron 1 together in the same place at the same time, meaning the same orbital, not necessarily the same single point in three-dimensional space. It's in the same orbital. But if we do this, we assume that this orbital comes to this orbital. That means that the second row becomes identical to the first row. If psi a and psi b are identical, then rows one and two are equal. This converts the determinant to zero. By one of the properties of determinants, if two rows or two columns of a determinant are equal, then the determinant overall is equal to zero. Determinants also have another uh, very useful property for anti-symmetric wave functions in that if we swap two rows or we swap two columns, which have the effect of swapping two electrons, the determinant changes sign exactly as it should for an anti-symmetric function. So if we assume that the two orbitals come together, this determinant becomes zero. In other words, the overall wave function now becomes identically zero. It's zero everywhere. What does that tell us? Well, if the wave function is equal to zero, that tells us that the probability density, psi star psi, sometimes we write it as psi squared, is equal to zero everywhere. And since the wave function is equal to zero everywhere, and the probability density is equal to zero everywhere, that tells us that the likelihood of finding either of the two electrons anywhere in space is zero. But that's a contradiction. It's a contradiction. So, poor thing is proof by contradiction here. We have a contradiction. We assumed that we started with two electrons with the same spin. We've proven that in that case, if we allow the two electrons to come together, that the overall wave function becomes identically zero everywhere which tells us that the probability of finding either of the two electrons anywhere is zero, which is a contradiction of the fact that we started with two electrons. Since we have derived a contradiction, that means that one of our assumptions must be false. And that is the assumption that we can allow psi b to come to psi a, that we can bring the two electrons 
to the same orbital at the same time. In effect, we've shown the Pauli exclusion principle that if we have two electrons with the same spin, they cannot be in the same place at the same time. They cannot be in the same orbital. I thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.